It is my utmost honor to introduce one of my personal heroes, Miss Ophelia Dahl. Um, in 1983, Miss Ophelia Dahl um, landed in Haiti, and she was working as a volunteer in a school for handicapped children. What she saw there indelibly marked her. Um, she saw ill health that plagued the lives of the poor and the inequities and injustices that underlied it. Um, together with Paul Farmer and other friends, she then co-founded Partners in Health and has been learning from the patients and the communities that, she's, that the organization serves um, around the world every year. Partners in Health is a legendary Massachusetts-based nonprofit organization that is dedicated to delivering quality health care to less fortunate communities around the world, anywhere from Haiti to the Navajo Nation, Siberia to Rwanda, and most recently, West Africa in the wake of the Ebola epidemic. Ms. Dahl served as the Executive Director of Partners in Health from 2001 to 2015, and now chairs the Board of Directors, um, helping the organization build healthcare systems in remote areas of the world to bring technology to the communities and to raise standards in global health. Ms. Dahl graduated from Wellesley College in 1994 as a Davis Scholar, Woo. and recently became a trustee of the college. Um, she would like me to mention that being part of the Albright Institute is the highlight of her year. Um, she is also a director's fellow at MIT's Media Lab and the vice president of the Rural Dahl Museum and Story Center, um, who, which is dedicated to her late father, whose literary estate she also co-directs. Um, so please join me in welcoming the amazing social justice and healthcare advocate and fellow Wellesley alumna, Ms. Ophelia Dahl. Hello, my name is Kanika, and today morning, I am pleased to introduce Mr. Emmanuel Kamanzi. Mr. Kamanzi graduated from the Business School of Netherlands with an MBA, and from the University of Rwanda with a bachelor's degree in business administration. In addition, Mr. Kamanzi also successfully completed global health delivery and management courses at Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Business School. Since then, he has held several senior positions with partners in health in Rwanda and the United States. While working in Partners in Health, he contributed to building Rwanda's health system through his work with various Rwandan government partners. Specifically, he managed several healthcare delivery projects and programs that included the construction, outfitting, and management of facilities such as the Butaro Hospital, Butaro Ambulatory Cancer Center, and the Kirehe um, Hospital. He currently serves as the Director of Campus Development at the University of Global Health Inequity, or UGHE, a Partners in Health initiative in Rwanda. In this role, he leads a diverse and interdisciplinary team of partners and contractors that are both in the public and private sector. As leader of this team, Mr. Kamanzi oversees an $8 million project to build the University of Global Health Equity's first permanent campus in Butaro in Northern Rwanda. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kamanzi. Good morning, everyone. We have a lot to talk about today, um, and we want to make sure that some of that is around discussion that we can have together, questions and, every, and, uh, and everything else. Um, Kamanzi is going to do most of the talking today about the new university still being built for global health equity in northern Rwanda. I'm delighted that um, some of our colleagues also are here today. Uh, Julia and Rebecca and Will have come here. Um, working here and also in Rwanda, um, colleagues of both of ours, thank you for, for your accompaniment. Um, and also just to say quickly that, um, you know, there's, uh, I, I, I was thinking about this when we were uh, talking yesterday, um, Kamanzi arrived from Rwanda yesterday afternoon, um, and we had been going back and forth over the last month, um, and Really, there are so many pieces and so many facets of our work that we could talk about easily for an hour each. So always the challenge for me is trying to um, focus on one particular thing to talk to all of you about. And um, a few years ago, it used to be that I talked a little bit about the history of Partners in Health, how we set up, 
um, what we did, how we grew, and all of that kind of thing. It's really very exciting today to be talking about, about this university, um, and I think something that all of you will be interested in. I was also reflecting on our, um, on our title here, Radical Innovations in Global Health, and it's, a, it's, a, it's subtle, but it's a little bit provocative. Um, and, um, and that is because um, when we think about um, innovations, we really think about, we tend to think about a, a thing, a device, a product, a, a, a solution, something that will help and make a kind of a grand difference quite quickly. For us, and what we've learned over time, is that the radical innovation is actually the delivery of healthcare in places that haven't yet seen it. And that is much, much longer and slower work. Um, because really, it's not that innovations aren't required. They, they, they very much are. It's really that the innovations, many of the most extraordinary innovations, actually occurred or were discovered even hundreds of years ago. Certainly 100 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, almost 100 years ago, antibiotics. That's a pretty radical innovation in, in, uh, in global health. Anesthesia, um, water um, systems, all of that kind of thing. We're, 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 we're coming up to almost 200 years on the Jon Snow situation in London in which um, he realized that access to clean water was an extremely important thing. The places in which we work do not have those things. So it would be kind of radical to make sure that we got those things in those places. But, but it's hard sometimes to convince people, not you all, but to convince people that that's the work that needs to get done. That's the exciting radical work. And I think that one of the things about the long view for us is to be able to see the change that takes place by persistent, long, sometimes grinding, extraordinarily rewarding work. So this is the mission of Partners in Health, easily found in other places. Um, as I said before, I could go into so many of these things. I could talk to you all month, and, talk, and hopefully you would talk right back to me about the notion of accompaniment, for example. Um, and, um, but this is our mission, and it is a radical mission. It is, um, even though we haven't changed a word of it in 30 years, and I sometimes am pretty amazed that we knew to make it that broad and that deep and that radical then. And really what that means is whenever, where, where you're working and when you work, choose a, a mission that is broad and deep, broad enough and deep enough and ambitious enough. Because if it's, if it's not, if it's simple and you can get it done, it's probably not a good enough mission. This is a hard mission to carry out, as my colleagues will, will tell you. Um, preferential option in the care. It's really about closing this equity gap, equity in, in healthcare, and it's, and it's difficult to do. But we, when we started as a group all of those years ago, we didn't, start, we didn't start to stay small. We wanted to grow. We started in a village in central Haiti, but we knew we would have to grow. That was exciting to us. And so in order to do that, you really have to, one of the, the things that we try to do all the time is to break the cycle of poverty and disease. Um, and in order to do that, you have to come up with a model. And you need partners to do it. And that's really what leads me to be able to say to Kamanzi, um, for Kamanzi to come, come on in in one second. I'm going to show you two more, two more slides. But that is, um, when you think about the long, slow work of this and the scale of it, the model has to be, um, has to be uh, expanded. And that's why we are connecting now, after three decades, to the University of Global Health, building a University um, of Global Health Equity that really addresses, in many ways, the scale question and, um, and many other questions that you'll hear from Kamanzi himself. Um, so part of this, I've already stressed the long term, the, 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 the expanded notion of this work. And so in the other two slides that I'm going to show you, I just want to show you this sort of um, this sense of what it means for us to be long term. Um, not a great picture. I took it 30 something years ago. Um, but this is my friend um, and colleague, um, Paul Farmer. And this is where, this is back in 1984. I had bought those um, scales in London from a grant for, with 500 pounds, bought a ton of them, and we were out there working with our colleagues 
um, and weighing babies at the time, um, making connections in the community. And this was um, one baby whose name was um, whose name is Bobby. Um, Paul uh, and I. They lived in the village. We became friends with that family, and. When you do this broad mission, you provide health care, you provide education, you make sure everyone has vaccines, you make sure they have access to clean water. And this is Bobby all these years later, um, who has just finished his residency um, in central Haiti. And one of the things that we want to make sure with the work that we're doing with the, with the university is that Bobby is not the exception. He's the rule. So it is a sort of extraordinary story, and, and I marvel at it every time I see it because I think about the accompaniment that he needed, but his accompaniment was no different than our expectations for ourselves or our own accompaniment um, in terms of those who've made sure that we've gotten to university and beyond. So this felt to me as though it was a good segue to pass this over to, um, to Kamanzi to introduce the University for Global Health Equity. So thank you, Kamanzi. Thank you, Ophelia. Good morning. Um, I'm so delighted today uh, to, to be here and uh, to speak to you. Um, as I was thinking about this last night, I, I got reminded that uh, last year, January 19th, the very day like today, is when um, my wife, uh, uh, our daughter, were uh, getting ready to leave our apartment in Brooklyn to get on the flight back to Rwanda um, to, um, uh, to take on the new responsibilities we were called for uh, to lead the work that I'm going to be talking to you. So when I got reminded about that, <laughs> it kind of felt really new in me and uh, really a good delight to be here, uh, to be speaking to you, and also to come back to this <coughs> lovely country and city of Boston where we've uh, created friends and and now getting to, to know you all. Um, <clears throat> I'm also thankful to, the, uh, to your director, uh, uh, Joanne, who uh, uh, offered the opportunity to, uh, for me to come and, and, and speak to you today. I had a great honor of welcoming her in Rwanda last year when she visited. And uh, I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I ended, uh, at the beginning, she said she was coming to learn about the work that we do in Rwanda, but I ended up being the one who learned a lot more from her when we were uh, visiting our sites. So it's, uh, I'm really thankful to that. So today, as Ophelia said, I'm going to be talking to you about the country that I'm, that I'm proudly calling home, and that is Rwanda. And I'm going to be talking to you about the global health work and the creation of the University of Global Health Equity um, uh, in Rwanda. So that, I'll keep close to that, and then we, uh, we leave adequate time to, for, uh, for discussions. Um, Rwanda, um, small country in the East African region, not a continent, it's a country on the African continent. Um, <laughs> because when I came here, many people were asking me, oh, where do you come from? I said, I come from Rwanda. Oh, Rwanda, that continent. It's not a continent. <laughs> um, small country in the East African region on the African continent. Um, I actually got to know Rwanda when I was about seven. That's when I got to know that I, my parents came from Rwanda, and that was the time when I was in Uganda, where I was born. Um, my parents flew to Uganda in the 1960s when violence started in Rwanda, and I ended up, ha I mean, finding myself there. Um, I returned in 1995, uh, just a few months after the genocide that you heard about, and um, that's when I got exposed to the country which I called home. Uh, in Uganda, we were called refugees, and of course, we, we accepted that because we were refugees. But this is a country, uh, you can read all of this, but the big thing I want to talk about here is this. Life expectancy, 64 years currently. When we returned from Uganda in 95, it was 33. And since then, for the last 
decade, it has been able to be doubled to this level. And I'll get to that uh, because as you learn this, you get to know why. How can a country turn this around in such a short time? Um, I want to talk about the genocide. And of course, you might have read this in the books, in, 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 the, in the articles, in the media. But uh, yeah, um, about a million people killed in only 90 days. 90 days, million people finished. Uh, killed by their fellow colleagues that they live together. And this is a country that we found when we came. Much as the life we were living, the, the refugee lifestyle we were living in in Uganda was unbearable, when we came, I mean, we found this being worse than the life that we were living in. I remember when I was going back and forth with my dad, I said, why would you have to bring us here? I think the life, the refugee life in Uganda was actually better than this. And that was in 1994. But you could find a country that is hopeless and helpless. Uh, people living in fear, um, no water, no electricity. You just have to like walk miles to draw water from nearby well. Actually, some of the wells at that time were just like full of human dead bodies, I mean, floating. And you could, I mean, just fetch water and, and bring it home. So that's the country that we found. Majority of the national infrastructure completely destroyed. When you come to healthcare, the healthcare infrastructure, the limited healthcare infrastructure that existed at the moment was destroyed. Healthcare professionals who survived actually left the country. Um, and that's the real Rwanda that we found. And at the moment, I mean, yes, we're told this is your country, this is your country of origin, but we were hesitant to call it our home country, you can understand. And then when we were there, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from the government, went to the university. When I graduated, I was offered a job at the university. But one thing I wanted to, to mention is that um, Living in that lifestyle, refugee lifestyle, and the exposure to a hopeless and helpless country left something within me of something I felt that I owe to the poor people and people who continue to live in, in lifestyle that I live to. So when I was offered the job at the university, yes, I took it, <laughs> it was the first job I got when I graduated, but I didn't feel like I was in a, in a better position to, to, to serve the communities that I thought I owed a lot. And that's what brought me to Partners in Health. When I learned about it in a conference, I met the country director, had him present, and I got the business card. I kept looking at it. And later I saw some jobs uh, advertised, I applied, I didn't know I was going to get it. But finally I was offered the job. And this job I was offered was a job to leave the National University of Rwanda, the big, one of the biggest institutions in the country, and go and serve in Kirehe, which was one of the rural places of the country. <laughs> and when I went there to visit before I accepted, I, I looked at it and uh, at first to me I was kind of like, yes, this is the place that I want. But I was thinking, oh, how are my friends going to look at it <laughs> if they see me leaving the renowned institution in the country and go to such a deep village. But I went back and I just signed, um, sent the acceptance letter and I packed my stuff and left the university. Many Friends of mine actually, I mean, couldn't believe it, but I left. Lived in a house without hot water, no electricity. I mean, the bucket shower that you've heard of, those are the things that I did. But I felt that fulfillment that I was in a position to give back. So Kirehe is one of the district hospitals partners in health. Um, supports in Rwanda, this is Rinhuavu Hospital, our first hospital to go to uh, in 2005. And this is Butaro Hospital, where I spent much of my time. Um, 
uh, and was honored to work with the team to oversee the actual development of this facility, beautiful facility, um, that currently house the National Cancer Center of Excellence, treating all cancer patients all over the country and beyond. Um, uh, and then a decade after, with that partnership, strong partnership, I'll get back to what partnership is uh, to most of you who um, want to learn about the global development work. Um, the partnership we had with the government, the incredible work uh, we did in that strong partnership resulted into this. And you can read this. I mean, in healthcare, having such a gains, um, and many people have written about this uh, being um, the most gains recorded elsewhere that Rwanda has uh, really achieved. Um, and with 12 years of that partnership, and I mean, I mean working with, the, with visionary leaders and mentors of Philia, we were thinking, okay, now we've got to this point, what remains next? How can we take this forward? How can we scale it? How can we add more value to the strong health system the country was building. And one of those ideas were the creation of the University of Global Health Equity. And again, you've, you've seen or heard or been to different universities, but today I wanna talk about the uniqueness and the radicality um, of the creation of the University of Global Health Equity. Um, it's a <clears throat> university based in Rwanda and we we have one, I, I normally call it simple, <laughs> mission of training the next generation of global health leaders who will become the real world's change makers. And when we talk about change makers, it's basically changing the status quo of how people think health can be extended to communities. We are, we are talking about health of populations. We're not talking about some individual groups. We're not talking about some zip codes. Um, we're not talking about piloting some groups and, and, and leave everybody behind. We are talking about the real essence of equity in healthcare and education. And this is what we're doing at Partners in Health, specifically at the University of Global Health Equity. We are training um, people who come from different backgrounds, Ministry of Health, uh, doctors and nurses who are working in rural areas, um, um, managers who work for international health organizations. Those are the type of students who come to us. Um, and like I said, we are radically changing the way healthcare is delivered. This is the first cohort of, of, of uh, our students who graduated. We are having another graduation coming up um, uh, in the summer. And um, this is the president of Rwanda and Madam First Lady and our leaders, Dr. Paul Farmer and Gary, um, and our vice chancellor. And these are students when they were graduating. And when you look at these students graduating, um, I mean, when you ask them, what are you going to do? What did you learn from here? They, they normally say, okay, we got to have the experience, the real practical and actionable experience of learning things by practice. And we, I mean, I've, they mentioned it, I've been to Harvard uh, School of Public Health, and you could see how students are struggling in that closed ended education system and lacking the real exposure and field experience, practical experience at the field to see how what we all read in theory and books can actually be turned into a real action. action. Action that makes real impact to people. And that's the secret source of what UGHE is doing. 
We want our students to be exposed to the real communities that need them. We want them to be pioneers of changes, not to accept the status quo. When they graduate, they will be in offices of Ministry of Health, offices of international health organizations, uh, managing uh, hospitals, managing the supply chain. Um, there will be nurses, there will be midwives, there will be doctors who are involved in the daily decisions they make on people. So we want them to have that experience and uh, practice during the time when they learn with us so that when they graduate they have the right skills they need to really make changes on people's lives and this is what we do. Um, you would say okay we, we've got a bunch of universities around the world but why do we need UGHE? Why, why did you think that the way of scaling up partners in health work was the first attempt being creation of the University of Global Health Equity. And this is the answer. Of course, the world still suffers the lack of adequate health professionals. You know that. And Rwanda is part of that world. Africa is part of that world. Um, the pedagogy that is used to prepare those students is something we need to change, I must say. And this is what we're doing at UGHE. Yes, we have classrooms, but when I get to talk to the university development, when you look at our, how our classrooms are built and, and, and structured, it's, it's a classroom that will allow student action and practice um, to sit in groups in direct contact, allow faculty to move around and inter interact with each and every individual student to really make them understand and learn from practice. Yes, we have books, uh, we have libraries, students will spend time there. When they, they come to, to the classroom, we want them to be in full interaction and, and, and conversation about real issues. Reading case studies of programs that have been successful, programs that have failed, and what they can learn from that. And this is what we're doing, and this is what we think needs to change globally from the experience we continue to see. And why in Rwanda, why in Africa? Of course, I mean, this says it all. When you look at the global burden of disease, I mean, Africa holds the big part of that burden. When you look at the health professionals that graduate every year from school, I mean, they graduate on the African continent, but the majority of them end up not serving on the continent. And actually those who stay, they prefer staying in the capital cities. And when we look at the people who really need the care, who are suffering to get care, who really need that expertise of those doctors, majority of them you will find them in rural areas. And a rural area like Butaro is just a testament of where development and access to care should start from. And I, I talked about Kirehe, Rimhavu, Butaro. Those are all the most rural areas of Rwanda where PIH works. And I will tell you, we are happy in a real engagement and, 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 and friendship with our communities. We love seeing them turn smiles on their faces when they come to our clinics. We love to visit them, do home visits, work with community health workers to check on them and see how they thrive. And uh, <clears throat> so 2000, uh, uh, 2015, we started the university and the two, uh, the one flagship <clears throat> um, Master of Science in Global Health Equity is the program that we started with up front. And like I said, we're graduating the second cohort uh, in the summer this year. And we also uh, run uh, uh, executive education courses with different groups of uh, professionals uh, coming from Gavi, um, WHO, and we are still having more groups to come. 
in the planning, we are planning to open the medical school that will welcome medical students uh, next year in, in the fall. And the nursing education program will also be following. Um, and that's how the university will continue to grow and also opening up uh, more programs. This is just a few of our faculty members, world class uh, faculty members who hail from the ministries of health, uh, high offices, um, people who lecture at other international schools at Harvard, uh, people who've been part of PIHG's 30 year work experience around the world, extending medical care to the most needy uh, people. And that's what our faculty members are. Um, and students that uh, we, I mean, this, you can see them uh, really how excited they were graduating, but we want them to really make changes, really make actions. We, we follow our alumni and we want to see them being successful and really making real impact that is needed. Um, while we develop the campus, we currently run our classrooms, uh, class lectures in Kigali, uh, where we have a classroom uh, facility. We also do so at the PIH teaching sites where we have training centers. But as we do this, um, we are building the campus. And this is the time frame um, we have, like I said, 2017, we graduated our uh, first cohort. And the piece I want to focus on is this, which is coming up soon. Um, and of course, more work remains uh, to be done, uh, establishing the clinical facilities of PIH um, and uh, the completion of a fully fledged campus in Butaro. And there's a reason as to why we chose Butaro. I mean, we had built this beautiful hospital that you see that is really developing healthcare in the region, in the country. Um, and the University of Global Health Equity will be situated just across this valley up here. And this will undoubtedly be one of our teaching hospitals for our medical students. So we, we wanted to have the, the university campus close to Butaro Hospital where we've made prior investments, but also get to transform the region into a medical and healthcare delivery hub for Rwanda. We are changing the status quo. Currently, we have referral hospitals in the capital Kigali referring cancer patients to this facility. Just think about that. That, I, I, I had never seen that elsewhere because we normally know oh, referral hospitals are the ones that can manage complicated cases. But now you see ambulances from the capital to the rural area. And that's the reversal of healthcare delivery we need to see with our students. Um, and this is the facility. Um, uh, I was honored to welcome your director to tour this facility that is under development. Um, and this is of the first phase of our campus. This is our commons area. This will be our classroom um, uh, lecture rooms and case study rooms, seminar rooms. So our library, our um, uh, libraries, science libraries and simulation centers. And down here we have uh, housing for our students and faculty. And it's all, I mean, this is a rendering of how the campus will look like when it gets complete. Uh, but I think this picture just uh, says it all. The Butaro Hospital I was talking about is just right here. And this is the whole facility. In the partnership we have the, with the government of Rwanda, I mean, they graciously offered us all of this land that you see here. And further phases of development will be happening here, here. So basically, this whole hill will be our campus. Um, but there's more than developing a campus itself. Uh, because as you do this, there's 
added impact that it can give to the communities around, this impact it can give to the entire country. And in doing this, um, more than 100 families were relocated from here. And you would ask yourself, where do they go? You've read about several developmental projects that has happened elsewhere. And instead of bringing benefits to the communities, they instead cause harm to the communities. And as we do this, these are the houses where families were relocated to. Modern, fully furnished houses. Some of them, when they moved in, I mean, it was their first time even to live in such a modern houses uh, in their lifestyle. And this is just a community close to, to the campus. And these are shelter for their cows. So each family got a cow and that is improving the family's nutritional status and also giving manure for agriculture. And those are the radical <clears throat> changes and, and facts you need to have in running projects of this kind. It's not all about developing the university campus, but also which other value that can bring to the communities around. <clears throat> they said I work with big team, I mean, it's a big team and includes people with different academic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, um, and they talked about partnership. There is, there's more about what partnership actually is. You got people come from different corners of the world, different cultural backgrounds, different perspectives. I mean, they just come together to be united by a common goal. And how do they work together? to make that happen. <laughs> so having had the opportunity to work for PIH on this side and lived in Rwanda, I mean, it's really, really motivating and I mean, interesting to see how that plays out. And that's where the real secret source of what we need our students to learn. How do you bring people together and work together to achieve a common goal? We have a group of engineers from this country uh, who are working with me. We have a group of engineers from Rwanda. I mean, we have the community of Butaro, which is just right at the center of the real campus development. We've, we've had more than 700 people, uh, and a majority of whom um, come from Rwanda. We have up to 200 women who are part of these mercenaries, and they just help and earn money and send their children to school, they pay health insurance premiums, they are able to make savings and just support their families. Um, and this can show you, I mean, the team that we work with. And for you as students, you need to learn more about what, but just unpack the terminology partnership and get to learn more from the, from the experience, what that actually means, right? Um, Sometimes people, oh, it means working with the government, lots of bureaucracies, I mean, the corruption. Fine, you will get exposed to that. But how do you navigate through all of that and get really something done? Of course, you have to spend time in the government offices. You need to challenge, you need to advocate, you need to fight for the right. And, and, and you get through. And that's, that's part of the partnership piece that I'm talking about. And then the future of UGHE, like I said, uh, we, we are guided more by the gaps we continue to see. And these are the uh, centers of excellence that are going to be part of our programming at that uh, campus. Uh, I won't spend too much time talking about this because you can read it. Um, and then someday, right? Talking about UGHE um, in Rwanda, but that's, that's, that's what global health is, right? And I'm going to uh, end by just one story, really a story that um, made the start of this year quite shocked. Uh, it's the story of a 50-year-old woman who um, worked for PIH as on the support team 
uh, running our laundry department at the hospital. Uh, in April last year, um, one of our doctors uh, saw her and uh, she saw a tumor uh, coming up on, on her neck. And she came to me, uh, she said, uh, she was just crying, she said, I'm afraid Regine is having some signs of cancer. And, and I said, no, that, that can't happen. We, we can't afford losing Regine. And she said, I saw a tumor, and she says it's something small. She thinks it'll go away. Um, and I said, what can we do to help her? Uh, she said, I, I had a short conversation with her. I asked her to see whether we can take a biopsy and, and, and just find out what is going on. And she, she wasn't willing to do that. Um, so of course, we wanted to respect her, respect her privacy, but also we wanted to help her. But she wasn't at that level where she really wanted to be examined. She said no. She lived in Rwanda. She, she grew up in Rwanda. She was born in Rwanda. She knew cancer was just a death sentence. And she knew it wasn't curable. Uh, much as she worked with us, and she saw a lot of cancer care work we did, and she saw patients really um, uh, battling cancer and really win it, she just didn't want to hear that she was actually even being sus suspected of cancer. And we kept talking to her, really trying to uh, explain and, 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 and teach her, and she didn't want to be diagnosed. It was until September when she was getting weaker and weaker, and she came to the hospital, and they said, we need, we need to send you to Kigali to do a CT scan and really find out where the palate tumor is. And she just didn't want to hear about that. She said, no, I'm going to go home, spend a good time with my family. I, I don't want to hear that I'm diagnosed of cancer. And towards, the, towards Christmas, she, I mean, her life kept uh, really being bad, and she came to the hospital at that time. She was helpless, and they did a um, CAT scan, and, and, and uh, I mean, her family brought her, and they said, we need to know what is bothering her. And they did a CT scan, and uh, I mean, the whole of her organs in the body was, was metastasized. Like, I mean, cancer had spread everywhere. And um, yeah, um, early this year, she passed away. She passed away at Butaro Hospital. And luckily, she was getting palliative care at the hospital to have a good end of her life. But when she died, I, I kind of thought about what can we do to prevent this? And you can imagine, had she had the exposure on cancer awareness, community-based cancer awareness programs run at her community, got the exposure to know more about cancer as a disease, got to know that there is treatment for cancer in such a communities where she lived, Maybe she would have <clears throat> accepted to be diagnosed earlier, which would give doctors high chances of treating her cancer. But she just didn't want to hear about that. She was very resistant. And by the time we learned that, I mean, she had cancer, it was too late to, to save her life. And it just left something in me to really believe that we need healthcare professionals who really understand this, who really live this, who really understand this lifestyle communities live in, and be able to educate, uh, sensitize, um, do the required awareness, and save such a life that we are building the infrastructure to save. Because building the infrastructure itself is not adequate to increase um, the, the use of the facilities. As you work on the infrastructure piece to have the required capacity to treat the diseases, you also need to educate the community to also understand that those um, 
uh, services exist and actually can help their lives. So I'll end from there, but that's, that has been really a hard story for me to reflect on as we start this year, but it just shows me the ton of work we need to do ahead of us. And, and that's, that's what global health is all about. So I will thank you. Um, and then we'll